Okay, looks like we're up and running. It's two o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and um, get going for today. Let me get um, my slides into presentation view, and then we'll be get the show on the road. Okay, so as you were logging in, we did have a couple of pre-webinar chat questions, and you may or may not have had time to ponder these. Uh, please feel free to return to these throughout the webinar. Go ahead and answer now, answer later, answer when something comes to you. That's fine. Um, Melissa wanted to know what types of assessments have you used in your teaching? Uh, which do you find to be the best for your students learning and which do you find to be the best for your teaching so if you have a response to any of those um, please feel free to go ahead and put that into the chat for us all right uh, welcome everyone to the sixth webinar of the 2019 Ignis season we're actually on um, the downslide of webinars now. We've got seven and we're on number six, so the countdown has started to the end of the season, unfortunately. Ignis is the, Latin, is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of Educational Technology and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and my good friend Kelly Meeson, joining us from Clover Park Technical College. Our topic today is using Canvas quiz statistics to measure student learning, and our presenter is Melissa Ziegler. A big thank you to Melissa for joining us today to share about this topic. We're Quick going to get- Quick interruption, Alyssa. Oh yeah, of course. Um, access to closed captioning has not been given to Lenore. Oh, I wonder what happened, okay. Um, hold on just a second. It's really important that we fix the captions. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do that now. Uh, let me find my participant panel. I think I have to stop sharing and then I know I did activate it. I don't know what happened. All right. There she is. Let me get this going here. No. Let's see it. You said she was in here twice. Okay, they're assigned to closed captions. Okay, are we good to go now? Looks like it's up and running. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Maybe she logged in a second time or something. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and mute your mic too, Kelly. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, so now we are going to uh, screen share again and get back to um, getting going here. Let's see. I'm going to make sure that I get the right thing shared. Okay, and we're going to go from the current slide this time. Okay, uh, we're back to the test your audio slide. Thank you um, for your patience during that short little brief interruption. Um, hopefully the captions are working correctly now. If they're not, um, please let me know and we'll um, try to get that fixed. Um, as I was saying, we are going to get started today with a very brief overview of Zoom and then just a few other minor housekeeping items. And then I'm going to hand it over to Kelly to officially introduce Melissa. So the first thing on the list is to go ahead and check your audio. If you haven't already done so, um, you may need to press the escape key to exit full screen view and find the audio menu. Um, I believe it might also show as a pop-up menu if you hover over the bottom of your screen. You can give that a test. Um, if you are experiencing any audio trouble or you do not have a headset or speakers, you can call in by phone at 1-669. 900-6833 and then enter meeting ID 361-298-378 and then the pound sign and that will get you into the audio for the meeting. And Kelly will put that number into the chat for anyone that needs it. All right, um, please note that all of our webinars are live captioned and you can access those captions by clicking on the CC button in your Zoom toolbar and that's at the bottom of your screen. And as I've mentioned in previous webinars, I have not been able to find a hotkey for that. So you do need to navigate the Zoom um, menu to, to open up the, the captions. Here are some Zoom links that you might find helpful during the webinar. You can access the Zoom keyboard shortcuts, and this is a bit.ly link, so you can access those at bit.ly slash zoom with a capital Z 
shortcuts with a capital S. And then you can also find the Zoom Help Center at another bit.ly link that we have here, and that's bit.ly slash Zoom with a capital Z dash help with a capital H. Okay, the participants panel is located near the top right of your right corner of your screen and the chat panel is located near the bottom right corner of your screen. And if you're not seeing these panels, um, you can click on more in the Zoom toolbar and then on participants or chat and you can add those into your view. Uh, please type your comments and questions into the Zoom group chat as we go, and when we get, and then we'll we'll get to those um, as soon as we can. Um, Melissa is going to take questions um, throughout the webinar today, so feel free to put those into the chat. Um, please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when you're sending a message so that we can all see it. And then um, for a full screen view, you can click on enter full screen and then you can exit it out again by clicking on escape, um, just depending on your preference. So you'll find the participant tools in the participants panel. You can raise your hand to ask a question by clicking on the hand icon. And then when it's your turn to speak, simply click the microphone icon to unmute your mic. But to cut down on background noise, please keep your mic muted when you're not speaking. And then please also keep your cameras turned off during the webinar for us, we'd appreciate that. If you click on more in the participants tool, you can find some emoticons um, to give applause or also to give a thumbs up. So be sure to investigate those tools that you have. And then the last thing is that this webinar is being recorded. You can find the captioned recording link on the ATL blog along with the full IGNIS schedule at bit.ly slash IGNIS, that's I-G-N-I-S, all caps, 2019 dash recordings with a capital R and all of those links will go into the chat if Kelly hasn't already gotten them there. So um, let me go ahead and turn it over to Kelly to introduce Melissa now. Take it away Kelly. Hi, hello everybody. Um, <coughs> Melissa started her college journey at Tacoma Community College as a high school running start student. I hope she wasn't one of my students. She came back to the campus in 2016 as the coordinator of organizational learning, running professional development programs for staff and faculty, and as an adjunct professor of psychology. Melissa earned her bachelor's in business administration from Gonzaga University and her master's in adult education and training from Seattle University. She then went on to complete her PhD in educational psychology and adult education from the Pennsylvania State University. While in graduate school, Melissa got a walking workstation and logged many, many miles on her treadmill while writing her dissertation. Throughout her career in higher education, Melissa has worked in many areas, including residence life, summer programs, operations, faculty development, online education, career services, athletics, and now organizational learning. She is passionate about access, equity, and social justice, and also about how these principles can be integrated into our teaching and learning. In her spare time, and I wonder how she gets Amy, Melissa enjoys being outdoors and has visited 28 of our nation's 59 national parks. This August, she is headed to Alaska to visit number 29, uh, the Kenai Fjords National Park. And Melissa, you are going to love that one. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Melissa Ziegler. Thanks, Thank Kelly. You. I'm really glad you're the one that had to pronounce Kenai Fjords because I'm not sure I could have done that. So you must have done some homework to make sure you said that right. All right, Melissa, I went ahead and stopped sharing so um, you can take over from here. Excellent. Thank you. That was yeah. a great introduction, Kelly. I appreciate it. Okay. Let me make sure I have everything up and running. There we go. Hey, looks good. Thank you. So thank you everyone for coming to this webinar this afternoon. I'm exciting to be excited to be talking to you about multiple choice testing. So will the test be multiple choice? Fully using Canvas quiz statistics to measure student learning. 
if you are like me and you have at any point in time told your students that there will be a test, I'm sure someone uh, asked you pretty quickly, will it be a multiple choice test? What types of questions are on it? Um, they're usually eager to know that. So if you are like me and potentially use multiple choice testing in your course, we're gonna go through some of the Canvas quiz statistics that may be helpful to you in refining your quizzes. Our learning objectives for this afternoon are Describe at least three ways to improve testing and item design. Find the quiz statistics links in Canvas. Explain the difference between the student and item analysis features. Describe standard deviation. Describe discrimination index. And identify at least two ways to use quiz statistics to improve future quizzes. I guess we all better pay attention because that's a big list. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big list. I feel fully confident. I do too. No, it's a great presentation. <laughs> so some vocabulary before we get too far down this road. So what do I mean by multiple choice test? So a multiple choice test has questions or items on it that have response options with a correct answer and usually at least one distractor, if not several. So usually we see the common multiple choice tests um, having questions that have four option answers. So, and that's usually A, B, C, and D. And you have, uh, respondents have the opportunity to choose an answer and one, only one of them is correct. When I use the term item during this session, item basically means the question. So in the formal definition, it's a task that students have to perform on a test. In our case, it's specifically a question on the test that they have to respond to. And that question or that item has a stem and distractors. The stem is the prompt or question part of the item. So it's that first, you know, what is the definition of? It's that portion of the question. And then the distractors are the incorrect response options. So if Letter C, we'll go with the casual letter C. If letter C is the correct answer, A, B, and D would be distractors. And then I didn't put this on here, but the correct response, I'm just gonna call it the correct answer or the correct response, would be the additional um, A, B, C, or D, in this case C, uh, that would be listed there with a stem. So good vocabulary for us to keep note of. Um, I might be switching between item and question, but I tend to use the term item and wanna make sure we're all on the same page about that. So we're going to be doing a quick poll, and this is our first poll, and Alyssa is going to have a poll prompt up on your screen. And the question is, do you assess your students' learning using multiple choice tests? So there should be a pop-up window on your screen with the question and yes or no, and you can click on yes or no and then click submit. We'll give just a second for those answers to tabulate, and then I will um, end the poll and share the results with everyone. Okay, looks like we might be close to being done, so I'm going to go ahead and end it now. And here's, here are the results. Can you see those? Yes, so 83% responded yes, that you use multiple choice tests, and 17% responded no. So we'll have a question and some discussion later on to get a little bit deeper into the different types of assessments we might choose or why we choose um, some. So be thinking about that though. And if you are gonna be using multiple choice tests, how to best use the features in Canvas to support your students' learning and your teaching. Oh, and now my clicker stopped working. Alyssa, my screen appears to be, oh, no, there we yep, go. You got, you got it. Okay. Go. Yep, go back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, nothing happened with okay. the poll, but we're back. Okay. So why do we test our students? I think there are two main reasons. So assessment and learning. So from the assessment side of using a test, the purpose is to discriminate between students based on mastery of learning objectives. Now, in this case, the word discriminate does not have a negative connotation. Uh, the connotation is trying to, to see the differences in students' um, knowledge and skills. So to tell the difference between students based on mastery of learning objectives. And you'll know when you're successful, if you have a high discriminability in your test, then you have more effective tests. So the more that you can discriminate the differences between students, and that would show a range of scores that 
match their true score on the test, the more effective the test is. On the other side, you could be testing for learning. So the purpose then would be to improve students' knowledge of learning objectives. And you would know you're successful when there are more students um, have knowledge increases after a test, the more effective a test. Uh, and you could kind of think of this in terms of formative and summative assessment, these two sides if you want to. Um, but I think there's also a way to have testing serve both of these purposes. And we'll talk about that uh, later about some strategies to make your test about assessment and learning at the same time. But I think it's important to consider when you're designing your test and then you're designing the qualifications for taking your test um, or the standards, which is more important to you or are they both important? And so how does that affect the design and the implementation of your test? So please use the chat to share if you use multiple choice tests, Right now, are you thinking that you're, they are for assessment, learning, or both? So if you have an example, please share that in the chat, or if you'd like to just say that your tests are primarily for assessment, primarily for learning, or both, and we'll see what comes up. We have a couple of responses so far, Melissa. Um, Kathy says that her multiple choice quizzes are for learning more than assessment. And um, G. Alexander says um, for learning. And that's all I've seen pop up so far. Kathy or G. Alexander, do you mind saying a little bit more in the chat? Um, or if you're comfortable, you could unmute yourself, but talk about um, in what ways your tests are used for learning and if there are methods you used in the in how you implement your tests to make them improve students learning Okay, we have another response from Marshall. Marshall says, primarily assessment. However, sometimes I will put the equations or formulas slash resources in the wording of the question so that it will reinforce them using that, but still prove that they can find the correct answer. Excellent. Uh, G. Alexander has added, um, I want to make sure that students are completing and comprehending assigned reading. Kathy has added, I'm really just trying to get my students to do a better job of reading the text that goes mm -hmm. with the course. The quiz questions tend to force the students into the text and get them to think through some of the meaning in the chapter. And P. Bushnell says both, as we go over the questions we discuss to reinforce topics. So there's a variety of responses in there, Melissa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's excellent, and I, I appreciate the different ways in which you're talking about how tests can be used for both. So Marshall, in your example of putting some cues into your stems of information that then the students won't have to recall and they can use recognition in terms of their cognitive practices and that reduces their load of what they have to remember in order to complete that item and also might get them, okay, yeah, I'm supposed to be thinking about this equation for this thing. Uh, and can help them more uh, truly ex exemplify their knowledge in that area. I think that's great. And Kathy, I really like your example about getting the students back into the text. That's similar to what I do with my tests for my students is I allow them to use their book partially because I want them to see it as this future resource that they could revisit as these topics come up later on or in future classes but also because now they're gonna analyze that text in a specific way um, using you know, a model of that item that helps guide what they should know about that material. So I think that's great, thank you. So I mentioned this in my response that we just talked about, I kind of alluded towards this, but there are two important things to consider when thinking about test design and I would say reliability and validity are often, in my opinion, misrepresented in a lot of texts and just a lot of, if you were to Google them, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, so 
when I think about reliability, I'm thinking specifically about classic true score theory, which talks about how the observed score we see on a test for a student is a combination of their true score plus error. So when we're designing a test, our goal is to reduce error. So in Marshall's example, where he's giving the equation in the STEM, it is an opportunity to reduce error because now, like I was saying, you have you then reduce the cognitive load that you're putting on a student to have to not only remember the equation, but then also remember how to use it. And if you specifically, you want to test the learning objective of the application of using that equation, um, it's important to give them the equation because if you don't, then you're potentially measuring their ability to recall the equation in addition to their ability to apply it. So depending on what you're measuring, you know, you really have to design your test around that. So when we think about reliability, often what gets reported is repeatability, which wipe that from your memories. Um, it's really about seeing that the, that observed score that we have on a test is a combination of error that's introduced as well as what their true score is on that uh, test. And also a test in and of itself cannot re be reliable. When we're talking about reliability, we're talking in terms of scores. So uh, we want to produce a test that will produce reliable scores and we analyze scores for reliability. So strategies to increase reliability, designing a speed or a power test based on your learning objectives. So a speed test is something that has a time restriction and is you know, really about how quickly can someone do something. And there might be times where that's an appropriate way to measure something related to your learning objectives if the transfer of it beyond the test is that there is going to be a time crunch or it will be something they have to do within a certain amount of time. But I would say for most of us, we're really interested in assessing that knowledge or the skill. And so we're really interested in a power test. We're trying to see, you know, what is it that they know? And what can easily happen though is given the nature of class times, particularly, particularly in in-person classes, we get these two things conflated. So if we have a 50 minute class session, that's all the time they have for the test. And so it's really important when we're designing a test that we're giving ample time for students to complete so that we're not conflating speed and power abilities in what we're assessing. In addition to that, to reduce error, writing simple multiple choice items. So we'll get into more details of this later, but avoiding complex multiple choice that say uh, A and B, but not C or all of the above, or um, A, B, and C in this scenario, but not D and E in this scenario, or something like that. Because once we get to that level of complexity, the type of cognition it takes for students to process that becomes more complex and more time consuming as well. And now the likelihood that we're just measuring their true score or what their knowledge really is about that decreases significantly and it increases the error. We also wanna to aim to write a moderately difficult test. So, that might be counterintuitive, depending on your philosophy of testing and your philosophy of assessment. But we want to have a test that's moderately difficult so that it does discriminate between students who are kind of on the lower performing end, the mid-range, and the high end. But if a, test is, if a test is too difficult, we often end up, over time, as students complete items, they may uh, face some sort of fatigue or lack of motivation as they complete the items their likelihood of being able to fully process as they move through is going to decrease. Um, in addition to, we're trying to discriminate between, you know, sort of that average range of student. And it, as it becomes more difficult, we might be able to discriminate between, oh, you know, this person who was gonna get a 95% and this person who's gonna get a 97, those high range students. But that may leave behind in the dust all the rest of our students who are in our class. On the other end, uh, related but different, is the idea of validity. So we want our scores to be valid. And validity is really the evidence to support the interpretation and use of test scores. So we're accumulating evidence to say that the way in which we're interpreting the scores of our students on the test is an accurate portrayal, <laughs> um, an appropriate use of how those, what those test scores mean. And so strategies to be able to increase validity are to align our items to learning objectives 
we're going to do some actual practice of that here in a little bit. Um, and evaluate scores as measures of knowledge and cognition. And so we are not only asking students to potentially recall something or there may be recognition involved or they're analyzing something, um, but we're also potentially asking them to think in a certain way. So modeling a certain type of cognition that they're going to need to use beyond the class, that transferability. And so if there's a certain type of cognitive process you want them to uh, practice, your test should ask for that and should align with that. And that will increase the validity of those scores. So let's get into a little bit more about item design and particularly for the STEMs. So we want our to align our items to our learning objectives. We just, I just mentioned that. And it's really important to think about each learning objective and then design items that align specifically with what you're asking for. What are you asking your students to know or do? So for example, a learning objective that is related particularly to recall could be which of the following buildings is the tallest in the world? Okay, so they just have to recall a fact. You're gonna have some options and they choose the correct option. If it's compare, which of the following is a way in which hawks differ from eagles? So you then would have four response options or three depending on what's most appropriate. And you'd be able to have the students go through that comparison thinking and your correct response and the distractors would be things you would want them to be able to decipher which is correct or incorrect. Or to analyze. Given that the patient shows symptoms X, Y, and Z, which of the following diagnoses is most likely? And then you would list those. So we also, thinking about phrasing of the STEMs, in addition to aligning them to our learning objectives, we want to phrase items positively. So don't use not, okay? Avoid using the word not in your, in your STEMs. Here's an example of negative phrasing. Which of the following is not an example of classical conditioning? A positive phrasing, which of the following is an example of classical conditioning? And unless there is a specific cognitive process and there's a reason behind why you want students to practice that, that transfers beyond the class, I would completely avoid not. The reason is because when you, when someone is reading the item, when a student's reading the item, now not only do they have to figure out whatever it is you're asking, but then they have to do the opposite. And for some students with depending on their experience with multiple choice testing as well as practice, that can be a really challenging cognitive spin for them that may not be a transferable cognitive skill that you want them to have outside the class. There may not be a scenario in which they're significantly having to look at not examples um, or whatever that is in critiquing something or figuring out an answer. So when we use positive phrasing, it reduces the error and the likelihood that a student will misunderstand or misread the question, and therefore we're able to more closely measure their true score. So I'd like us to practice a little bit of matching learning objectives to our STEMs. So how could you better align this STEM to this learning objective? The learning objective is Determine the most appropriate exercise modality for health maintenance in elderly patients. The STEM is, which of the following is the definition of exercise modality? Not to say that that STEM is completely inappropriate to have on the test anywhere, but if we were designing a STEM that aligned with that learning objective, how might we rephrase the STEM or create a whole new question that would better align with that learning objective? So please share your answers in the chat if you have one, and we'll hopefully have a couple of examples. Yeah, we'll give you just a second or two to think on that, but go ahead and um, type your responses into the chat. I'm gonna, I'll take a stab at it here too, but I'm, I need to think about it for a second.
Okay, let's take a look in here and see what's in here. Um, see, Kelly says, which of the following exercise modalities are most appropriate for elderly patients? And C. Cowden says that STEM might be a first step, but it doesn't address appropriateness, which seems to be the key concept of the learning objective. And then um, when I said I was, I was gonna take a try at it, um, the one I posted was identify the most appropriate exercise modality for health maintenance in elderly patients and explain why. And so that's what's in the chat right now, Melissa. Thank you. Yeah. And good examples, Kelly and Alyssa, thank you. And Craig, I appreciate your point about doesn't approach what appropriateness is. And I also like the idea that you said about a good start because you could have several items that are within the same test that are about this learning objective. So maybe there are pieces to this learning objective. And the first is you need to make sure they understand the definition of exercise modality. Maybe you also need a question to, under, to see, do they understand the concept of appropriate exercise? And then after that item, you then may have a question like Kelly or Alyssa phrased of which of the following is the most appropriate exercise modality. And that way you could see at what point in a student's skill or in their knowledge, what point are they missing the information to be able to reach this learning objective? <laughs> hey, Melissa, Erin just posted one um, that looks really great. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. Um, it says, Janet is a blank person who struggle, struggles with blank and typically does X amount of activity in her daily life. Which exercise modality would you recommend for her? That's kind of an interesting approach. Yes, I love that. Thank you. Um, that's I and I really enjoy putting scenario prompts and then the student then analyzes that stem and says, okay, we're reading this situation and then I have to apply this specific ask to the situation. And for this learning objective, I think that would be a great way of determining the most appropriate exercise modality for health maintenance and elderly patients. Excellent. One more practice for positive phrasing. How could you rephrase this stem using positive phrasing? The negative phrasing is, which of the following is not an appropriate exercise modality for health maintenance for elderly patients? Please share an answer in the chat. So Melissa, I'm not a very good typist and anybody that knows me knows that. So instead of retyping all of this into the chat for everyone to read, could I just take a verbal mm -hmm. approach to it? Okay. Um, I would say maybe we could just take the not out and just ask the student which of the following is an appropriate exercise modal modality for health maintenance for elderly patients. I mean, it might not take that much rephrasing just to take the not out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the simplest fix for these. And it's the lowest burden for us as we design items when we're going through, we may realize, oh, you know, I didn't mean to put a negative phrasing in there. I need to quickly get it out. The quickest way is to exactly which of the following is an appropriate exercise modality for health maintenance for elderly patients. Um, Dale posted one that's kind of interesting. Dale says, which of the following exercise modalities should be avoided for health maintenance for elderly patients? So that brings in maybe a little bit of discrimination into, you know, they have to be able to discriminate to discriminate between um, like appropriateness. Yeah, and I think that would get to that learning objective of determining the most appropriate way. Um, and I think you'd still have to be a little bit careful about the should be avoided. But at the same time, if you want them to be able to in real life, right, in real life, I'm putting that in air quotes, you can't see, uh, in real life beyond this testing scenario, is that what they're going to have to do? And that's where I think sometimes you could potentially use negative phrasing or you could phrase things in that, in that way. Uh, you just have to make sure that that aligns with not only your learning objective, but the transfer of that knowledge or that skill, but that knowledge beyond the test. So, and I would say probably for someone in the health profession, they probably would have to 
may go through the cognitive process of ensuring that they're avoiding the right things for certain types of patients. Great. So now that we've talked a little bit about the STEM design, we're going to talk about item design and particularly the distractors. So this is, um, I feel like, just often the most challenging for me and often becomes an afterthought, which is not the best design I, a method. I don't recommend it. Um, but we want to use a simple format. So a list of possible responses where only one is correct. We want to stick to, when we're looking at the distractors and the response options, there's definitely only one correct answer. And the, there is research on the number of distractors that's appropriate. So usually you see three, sometimes two distractors, but you should base the number of distractors that you choose on the quality of the distractors. So each distractor should be just as plausible as the next distractor in figuring out when a student is going through that item, okay, what is the right answer? If you have a distractor that's completely irrelevant, um, maybe it's a joke, or something um, that you think is funny, that's wonderful. Uh, and you may want to take it out because it's not serving a purpose, it's not contributing to the quality of that item, and it also may throw some students off and they may just get a little confused by it. Um, and I thought this was interesting when I was going through some of the literature, again on this, that using the correct answers for one item, using them also on another item, that it benefits student learning because they're processing those response options in several scenarios and deepening their associations with how those response options may be related to different concepts. So if you're really looking from a learning perspective, repeating the same, let's say if it's four concepts you're asking about, repeating those same response options on one or more items, or more than one item, could benefit students' learning. Also, using simple vocabulary that aligns with your textbook and your teaching. So if you've been calling something, um, let's say you're testing people on test design, if you've been calling it an item in class, but then you go to your test and you design it using the term question, again, that's going to introduce error into your student scores. You also want to rotate the correct answers within the distractors throughout the test. So I will admit the first time I used Canvas tests, <laughs> I didn't click the button that uh, randomized the response options. And so I had for a brief period of time, a test that was open where I think every correct answer was A. Um, so that was a bit embarrassing. So make sure there is an option for that in Canvas. Uh, make sure that you turn that on so that not all of your correct answers are C or A in this scenario. You also want to avoid using none of the above or all of the above or A and C, etc. The combination of responses uh, makes the item more complex and therefore requires a different type and level of processing from students. And as much as possible, you want to avoid those. If you have something that's all of the above, well, all a student has to do is realize that A and C, they know to be correct. Well, if A and C are both correct, and there's an all of the above option, then that means D has to be the right answer. So now you're not no longer assessing their knowledge, you're assessing their test taking abilities at that point. <clears throat> Same with none of the above. If they know that one of them is wrong, now they can skip straight to none of the above and you lose out on that time where they would have processed each response and actually increase their learning. The one other important thing on the none of above and all of above, Melissa, that mm -hmm. I've run into is if you do that and then you randomize in Canvas, all of the above and none of the above aren't really all or none of the above anymore because they get moved around. Yes. And that really confuses yes. students. <laughs> right, they're like, oh, excuse me, professor. A says none of the above. Yes. Yeah, and they're not even labeled A, B, C. They're just little radio buttons. So, yeah. yeah. That's that a good point. Confusing. So. You also want to aim for each response option to be about the same length. Students who are good test takers will know that generally the correct answer tends to be the longest answer. And in making that plausibility factor with each of the distractors, they're more plausible if there are similarities in the structure of each option. If something seems way off than the others, then it's either a cue to them that it's totally wrong or potentially is a cue to them that it's the correct answer. And then again, instead of processing 
what you're actually, the content of each of those distractors, they're now processing the structure of your item. And then last but not least, check for spelling, punctuation, and grammar because that can introduce error into your item design. And we, you know, a small uh, spelling error or grammar error can, particularly for students who um, English may be a second language or may need more processing time, that can really introduce a lot of error into their uh, test score. Melissa, before you go on to the next slide, um, we do have a question in the chat from Marshall. And Marshall um, just wants some clarification on um, your pointer about repeating the items. And um, mm -hmm. the question is repeat them as correct answers or repeat them as distractors. So could you just clarify that real quick for us, please? Oh, good question. So repeat them as a response set. So if A, uh, B, C, and D in one question, then you would reuse A, B, C, and D in the same exact format for a different item. And the literature that I was reading on that talked about how that benefits students learning because now they have processed those items in the context of one scenario or of one STEM that you've introduced and they've had to apply it in there and then they read it again and it's applied then in a different, okay. And in terms of their learning, now those associations they have with those concepts and the stems that you're introducing the concepts in those stems is going to become stronger more complex as they realize how those are related uh, from an assessment perspective i would say this one gets a little bit tricky because you could potentially uh, cue students from one question to the next so we want our items to be structured independently of one another such that you don't need to get one question right to be able to get the next question right, or if you realize, oh, the, that question's actually given the answer away to this next question. We want our items to be independent of one another. So I would say this, this point in particular depends on if you're more focused on that learning piece or that assessment piece. I would say it has a big enough benefit to learning and, and not a very big detriment to assessment that you might consider using this. Um, and it could be something really good as well when you debriefed items with students after a test to talk about how the why those are plausible distractors for those two stems and how those concepts are related to help again students deepen those associations and they have with those concepts and just a quick time check melissa we have about 17 minutes left okay okay yeah um so I'm gonna skip this practice so that we have time to do other things because there's some cool things coming as well. Um, and this is hopefully at this point with all the talking we've been doing, some of these issues are glaring. Um, but the STEM here says, which of the following is an appropriate exercise modality for health maintenance for elderly patients? And a few of the issues, the phrasing is completely different in each one. There's an A and B option. <laughs> um, the one is a, Aqua therapy is a noun, and then these other ones start with verbs about working, starting. So again, you would want parallel structure and similar response option phrasing in each of these to make it make them plausible distractors and make those align with your step. So before we move on to our next piece, which is really getting into the statistics, a poll, what is the most difficult part of the item for you to write? The stem, the correct answer, or the distractors? So your screen should pop up with an opportunity to respond to this. And if you're like me, I know what I'm gonna put. Okay, we'll give just a minute or two for that to, well, maybe not a full minute, but um, just a couple more seconds to get the answer right on that. A couple minutes on a webinar, dead air space is a long time, so we won't leave you hanging quite that long. <laughs> you don't want me to get into my awful jokes and stand-up routine. No one will be laughing, so. <laughs> oh, we might. That We can do that as an encore at the end. We'll see yes, yes, my, my testing, my stand-up on testing is going to be really riveting for you all. Okay, it looks like we've got quite a few um answers here. So let me go ahead and share those results with everybody. So hopefully you can see those now. Yes. So 10% said the STEM and 90% said the distractors. So I was also part of that 90%. I, I, that I totally part, agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think in some ways when I design items, if I'm doing a really good job, I try to think about 
what are the areas that I know are somewhat related to this concept, but I want to make sure students know the difference between, and I want them to be, when they're thinking, I want them to think thing, think things through of, okay, no, it's probably not that, it's not this, these are related. So what is, how are those concepts related? And getting into a point where I can, okay, this would be a pretty plausible distractor if they don't understand this concept, they might go here. And often what I find myself doing is I can come up with one really good distractor, maybe a second one, and then a third is often a stretch. So in some analysis I've been doing since I was preparing for this webinar, I think I'm probably gonna cut down the number of distractors I have so that they're more plausible because the, some of them that I have where there's four response options, one of them's basically a throwaway, which as we learned is not useful in terms of item performance. Um, okay, so we've written our items and students have completed our test. Now what? So now we're going to get into actually using Canvas for the statistics that are available, which I've been really impressed with. I have not used them to their full entirety, but I want to because when I was kind of getting into, oh, there is so much available for you and we don't want to get overwhelmed. But even on this first quiz summary screen, which I will show you in Canvas here in a few minutes, there are some great things available. So important terms before we move forward, standard deviation. So uh, sigma or square root of the variance is the technical definition of standard deviation. So it's the spread of your scores. So you can see that I have an image here that says quiz summary and it has average score 75, high score 88, low score 63, standard deviation 2.66 an average time, an hour 43 with 55 seconds. And below that is uh, just a like bar chart with it shows a distribution of scores um, by percentage. And that standard deviation is gonna give us a sense of, okay, how spread out from the average were my students? And you know your students, and so when you have them complete a test and you're looking at this quiz summary, you should get a sense for, okay, how did I think they would perform? How much do I think they know about these topics? And does that align with what I'm seeing in this standard deviation here? Additionally, on the quiz summary page, Canvas gives us the discrimination index. So the discrimination index is how well an item discriminates between students according to how they did on the test. And it's really the effectiveness of an item. So we wanna know, um, you know, for our students who scored high on the test overall, did they get this question right? Did this question really differentiate between students who did well on the test and in theory understand these concepts and the students who didn't do well on the test and don't understand the concepts? So we are looking for this number right here. It's 0.53 as an example. We want that to be over 0.24. And Canvas has a cool um, queuing mechanism for us where if it's 0.24 or below, it'll be in red. If it's above 0.24, so 0.25 and above, it'll be in black. And that's a point by serial correlation between the answer correct, incorrect, and the overall score on the test. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. And below that is the percent of students who answered it correctly. So there are some items you may have specifically designed to be easy because you wanted students, as they got into the, your test, you wanted them to kind of warm up or maybe within a learning objective, you are there's some foundational pieces that you're pretty sure everybody knows you're still gonna ask about. So for those, the discrimination index might be really low and the percent who answered correctly might be really high and that's okay. So it's thinking about what was the intention of that item and then what are the scores, uh, the discrimination index and the percent correct based on the intention of that item. Moving further into Canvas quiz statistics, we have student analysis and item analysis reports that are available. So the student analysis is the student responses by row. So this is an example, this image shows an Excel spreadsheet that's been downloaded from Canvas and it's supposed to look messy for a reason because I wanna prepare you that if you're gonna get into this data, it's an Excel spreadsheet with raw data. So you're gonna to have to go through it on your own. And it goes row by row and gives students responses to every single item. And that can be great for students who you're gonna meet with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if there are students you're watching because you're kind of worried about them and you wanna get a sense of like, oh, you know, how, 
how did this go for that particular student? That's where I would really get into the student analysis uh, spreadsheet. The item analysis spreadsheet is really more about if I'm going to be reusing these items for a test in the future, or if I'm going to be reusing some of the items, it gives me several indicators on the effectiveness of my items. So the difficulty index is the proportion of students who answered correctly. So the higher the number, the more students who answered correctly. It's also been called the item easiness index because the higher the number, the more students who got it right, which means the question was easier. But the difficulty index will give you a sense of, okay, was this question at the level of difficulty that I thought it was going to be or not? The correct student count, how many students got the answer right? So that'll tell you, okay, of the 30 students in my class, 10 got this question right. The standard deviation by item, that's the spread for each item. So easier questions should have a smaller standard deviation, so the spread should be a lot smaller, and harder questions should have a larger standard deviation. Um, and then the point, point by serial of the distractors, this is pretty cool that it gives you this information. So it's a correlation between whether or not the student chose or did not choose uh, a certain distractor and then their overall score on the test. And so that's why it's a point by serial correlation, it's a dichotomous and continuous correlation. And we want our distractors to be equally appealing. So we can actually go into, download the spreadsheet, and we can see, okay, which distractors were more responded to than others, and what did that correlation look like in relation to students' overall scores? To see which types of distractors distracted which type of, of performers on our test. Now, this item analysis can get really, really complex. Um, and as someone who feels somewhat comfortable, pretty comfortable in this, like I said, I have not used this level of detail because I haven't put the time into it, but it got me pretty excited when I, was, when I have been in there about how far into this you could go. And if you are someone who reuses test items or reuses complete tests, this is where I would say really spend some time getting comfortable in what these terms mean so that you can really hone your test to ensure that you're reducing that error and you're measuring students' true scores as much as possible. I'm gonna, instead of giving you the opportunity to practice this, I'm gonna go over it myself really quickly because we're low on time and I wanna get to the Canvas demo to show you where all of this is. So this question says, which of the following discrimination indices re represents an item that best discriminates among students? 0.47 with 69% answering correctly, 0.56 with 92% answering correctly, or 0.22 with 85% answering correctly. Now, I would say that 0.47 with 69% answering correctly, to me, is a more effective item. Now, even though 0.47 is slightly lower than 0.56, the 0.56 item had 92 people, 92% 92 of people answer it correctly. So what that means is, of the few people who answered it incorrectly, they were our low performers on the test. But that item doesn't necessarily tell me a lot of that kind of mid-range differentiating between students. Um, it kind of tells me the bulk of the class understood this and maybe one or two people didn't quite get it. Whereas 0.47 to me is a more interesting item and gives me more information because it's still doing an effective job discriminating between my high performers, my mid-range and my low performers, uh, but only 69% got it right. And so I'm thinking about, okay, is that what I expected on that item? And that's going to help me differentiate between who better understands these concepts and who doesn't. So in summary, with the student analysis and the item analysis, thinking about how to use these two awesome data sets that you can download out of Canvas, what to do with them. So from the student analysis perspective, again, how did a particular student respond? You know your students. Who did you expect to know a topic and didn't? And that gives you opportunity for one-on-one -on -one follow up. So if you wanna move from that assessment place to that learning space with your test, that follow up is a critical learning piece where you can revisit those items with that student and clarify their confusion on those specific items or even maybe how they, their 
maybe during the test you could tell that they just it got kind of worse over time so you can talk about testing anxiety or testing ability or just open a conversation with that student from the item analysis side you can really get down to kind of well was it the item the concept or both that students didn't understand did my distractors distract appropriately and it gives you the opportunity to item by item or maybe a few example items come back to your class and model your thinking as you explain the correct answers in comparison to distractors that can be an incredible learning opportunity for your students and i'm guilty of this maybe others are as well of kind of giving a test and then the test is done and we moved on to the next thing well that was kind of great for assessment but if i want my students to really have this long term foundational knowledge and really meet these learning objectives towards my learning outcomes, then revisiting those items is going to be important in that. Okay, how do we find all of this in Canvas? I'm going to stop share so I can reshare to a new screen. And I'm going to show you one of my quiz summaries for the final quiz uh, test I did in my Psych 100 class. So how you would navigate to here, on the left side of the screen in Canvas, there is a quizzes link, so you click on quizzes. I'm looking at module three and four test. I click on that. And then I click on quiz statistics over here on the right. And Canvas is gonna take a second to generate um, my quiz statistics for this, my quiz summary. And then you can scroll and look item by item. So I tend to start my tests out with um, easier responses in the beginning to build up students' confidence. I also like to kind of put in easier questions throughout to maintain that confidence for those who may still be struggling. Um, and I could go through here and I could look at, like, okay, this 0.56 discrimination index this looks like it did a pretty good job, but even just initially looking at these response options, it's pretty clear to me that maybe these two other distractors need to be redone because they didn't tempt anyone to answer them. Or also maybe there's something in the way that I taught that confused students between psychoanalytic and humanistic theory. So I could go through item by item and prepare how I'm gonna debrief this with my students as well as how I could uh, redesign these items for the future. And if I were going to download the student analysis and the item analysis, that is right up here in the right hand corner. And it takes a minute because it has to actually generate the report and then you'll be able to download it on your computer. So it's 2.59 and I went up until the very end, but there might be time for a brief question if Alyssa allows that. Oh, it's totally fine. I actually put into the chat that we might run a few minutes over today. So if you can stay and hang out or have questions for Melissa, um, please um, stay with us for just another couple minutes. And if you just need to run because it's straight up three o'clock, that is totally fine too. Um, you can always come back and watch the last couple of minutes on the recording when I get that posted next week. So um, let's go ahead and have questions and comments. I'm just going through the chat right now um, to see if there was anything we missed. Uh, there are some comments from earlier, um, just um, answers to the initial couple of questions we asked in the pre-webinar chat, um, if you want to go through those. Um, but I do think we addressed most of the questions as we went, but I'll just go ahead and scan through here okay. and see. Um, so go ahead and keep talking and I'll let you know if I come up with um, anything in here. Okay. I think the, the other thing I would say that I mentioned earlier that I think is really important to revisit is to look at the spread of scores and take the time to reflect, does this match how I anticipated my students would perform? Does this match how I think students seem to present their knowledge in class or how I've assessed them in other ways? And if not, how much of that is about how I taught a subject, about maybe how and when the students took the test, um, what other factors could be involved, and then talking about that with my students. So being very transparent with them about, you know, that I anticipated after this test that I would see these types of scores, and I was really happy that I saw these types of scores, or 
you know, I was confused as to why I saw these scores and let's have a conversation about, you know, what happened or what, how you felt about the test. And that may be in a class discussion, that might be one-on-one -on -one with students, but part of my job, I think, as a professor is not to just make sure my students have met the learning outcomes, but also teach them how to learn better. And so for me, revisiting these types of data and having open communication with my students about it and spending time modeling how I imagine their cognition and their cognitive processing would go during the test and maybe what happened, that's teaching them about learning and teaching them how to be a better learner. So I don't think we can downplay that. You know, it's something that's really, really important to be thinking about when it comes to not only your test design, but then what do you do after the test to support your students. We do have a question. Um, I think it's Craig says, how much time do you give per item? I actually do it differently for different classes. So I allow my students, I focus on my testing is very learning focused. It's a lot less assessment focused. So I allow my students to take the test outside of class and there is no time limit specifically because for the one thing I think some of my students often need an accommodation to have more time. Um, but also I think we have a lot of students who are undiagnosed with learning disabilities or test anxiety who would benefit from more time um, and it would reduce that error so I can get closer to their true score. And then additionally, in terms of class time, I find that then students can take it in an environment that's more suitable for them. But you know that does introduce some possibilities for other error like getting support from other students or having other people around. Um, but I do allow them to open book, open notes, because I really want my test to be about being able to apply what we've learned in those materials and learning the material as they're being tested on it. So I don't have a time frame per item. I think if you were going to come up with a time frame, it'd probably be doing some sort of pre-test or way of gathering what the average time needed would be and then modeling the rest of your tests for the quarter with that specific group of students after that. Um, but I would say whatever you think they need, maybe add some more time because, you know, just the cognition that it takes to complete a test mixed with students' motivation and their emotions, it gets pretty complex really quickly. And then again, that error can creep up and then we start measuring things that we don't, we didn't want to measure in the beginning. I'm not seeing any other questions in here, um, but please feel free to go ahead and um, get those into the chat as we're closing out and we'll come back to them if we get any additional questions. Melissa, if you'll just stop your screen share, I can take over from here. Um, and before we close out, I really just want to say thank you to you for sharing this with us today. I think this is um, a really neat topic and there's so much stuff in Canvas that, you know, even if you spend a lot of time in there, you either don't know that stuff's in there or you may not have time to go in and investigate so I really love when people come in and you know kind of show the different things they're using and the, and the tools they have so um, a big thank you to you um, for sharing this with us and um, also to our audience for joining us today so um, thanks for being here appreciate it uh, awesome. we thank you <laughs> yeah yeah, um, I did put your contact information into the chat, so if anybody has follow-up questions for Melissa, uh, her email is in the chat. You can go ahead and snag it from there. And then um, just to let you know, we have rescheduled next week's webinar. It was originally scheduled for uh, June 6th. We have had to move that to June 13th. Um, it is our seventh and final Ignis webinar of the 29th season. Um, so please do join us for that. We have um, Jeremy Wynn from Grays Harbor and he is going to be presenting Game Over, Why Your Attempts to Gamify Your Course Don't Work and How to Fix It. And I can just hardly wait that extra week because I've been looking forward to this one all season. So um, I hope you'll um, all come back and, and join us for uh, the last webinar of the season in a couple of weeks and I'll get a promotional um, 
information sent out on the listserv um, for that. If you do have questions um, about IGNIS, feel free to contact myself or Kelly. And um, I'm at ASLs at sbctc.edu. And Kelly is Kelly Meeson at cptc.edu. Um, Either one of us would be happy to answer any Ignis questions um, you might have. And just thank you again for joining us. And um, I can't see the chat right now, so I'm not sure if anybody has added any additional questions. Kelly, maybe you could um, take a quick peek there and see if there's, or Melissa, you could look to and see if there's um, anything else we need to follow up on. I see lots of thank yous and um, great webinar comment and thanks all. So thank you again, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and turn off our um, recording now. And um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Alyssa. It was a great show. And thanks, Melissa. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Thank this you. was awesome. Let me find my toolbar to turn off our recording. I don't know why I keep losing the toolbar. There it is. Okay, stop recording. There we go. It keeps moving screens. I know.